Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Horsford and I'm proud to represent Nevada's 4th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm really pleased to be able to talk with you all today about heart disease. Almost eight years ago, I was diagnosed with a hereditary heart condition that required me to have a surgical procedure. I was 40 years old, in relatively good health, and had no way to know that this was coming or how to prepare for it beforehand. The doctors ended up needing to do a six-way bypass heart surgery in order to correct the condition, but thankfully, I had a full and quick recovery. My experience is all too common among Black lives, when African Americans have the highest rates of heart disease among any ethnic group. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, African Americans are 30% more likely to die from heart disease than non-Hispanic whites. This disproportionate rate is something that must be addressed, and we need to ensure that our community has equal access to health care so that, like me, the doctors can detect heart conditions early enough and save Black lives. The first step to improve our odds of preventing and beating these diseases is awareness. By understanding the risks and taking simple steps like getting your blood, checked, uh, blood pressure checked regularly, eating more healthy and staying physically active, we can reduce heart disease among the black community. Conversations like these are also critically important to continue to raise awareness about cardiovascular risk among black men and women. I'd like to thank all of the panelists and experts for their insights into the risks of these diseases and how we can empower black men to be the healthiest versions of themselves. Thank you all for this opportunity and I hope to see you in the very near future. that can contribute to an elevated blood pressure. And that's why it's very important to know what those triggers are so that you can manage those triggers so that you can reduce your stress level, reduce your anxiety exposure, and at the same time, reduce your episodes of hypertension and high blood pressure. All right? Thank you so much. So we're gonna talk about stress a bit more uh, as we get going but I wanna hear from our athlete about physical fitness because that's one of the ways we can help to minimize the risk. So tell us about being fit and active. Well, being fit and active has so many benefits. Um, and then once you see the list, you would definitely wanna make sure that you engage in some type of activity to keep your, uh, your heart healthy and um, it's, it's a lifestyle, really. Um, you know, whether you're walking, um, exercise is the best stress management. Um, and, it's, and it beats sitting around the couch all day doing nothing, getting stressed out for no reason. But um, exercise is so important because it stabilizes your blood sugars, it reduces inflammation, and you just feel better when you, when you leave. You know what I mean? If something's bothering you, go to the gym and work out. You know, do cardio for a half hour, exercise for an hour. You will feel so much better. How many, how many people in the room exercise? Raise your hand. All right. So, question: What's the best investment that you ever make? What's the answer? Bingo! That's the best investment you ever make. So. Being healthy is not just exercise, it's also nutritional. And when you talk about heart health, you're talking about eating proper foods, which means that if you're eating fried foods, guess what builds up in your arteries? Plaque. And then when the arteries get clogged with plaque, then there's less, you know, uh, there's less uh, blood to get to the heart and, you know, it causes a lot of health issues. And one thing that I've learned from dealing with clients is nobody wants to hear from the immediate family. They want to hear from an outside source. And it's the truth. I lost a sister because of health issues, you know, living an unhealthy lifestyle. 
Uh, I, I just recently lost a, my father from a massive heart attack in October. And I was always on this case that you gotta walk, you gotta exercise, you gotta eat right. And with him being from the South, you know, you he's, he was 78. And being from the South, you are accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Not just in South Carolina, but a lot of, a lot of the Southern states are considered unhealthy from many statistics. So it's really, really is about you making the best investment which is in yourself and just educating, educating yourself, you know, on how to exercise properly, how to stretch properly, the importance of cardiovascular activity and learn, just learning how your body responds to certain exercises and so forth is very important. Um, we're here to take on some questions and there's so much I can get into from the fitness perspective. So we're here and uh, I'm ready to rock and roll. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. That's it's so important and you know, y'all can't tell because you know the shirt's a little oversized, but I'm I'm built like him under here. So. <laughs> All right. So you're here today to talk about health. Why is this important to you and your people? Me talking about health, why it's important to me, like being a bar for 25 plus years and being in the community, also a coach for like 25 youth sports. It's very important about the stories that I've heard and things that I saw about uh, black men health. I had a friend that had a triple bypass surgery that worked out every day. He would go to the gym at least for two and a half hours, five days a week for at least the past five, six years. He turned 50 and had a medical issue at home where his wife had to make a phone call, He'd get, uh, get an ambulance, go to the hospital, had to have immediate surgery. If they would have waited maybe another 10, 15 minutes, he would have died on the table once they started. Uh, that's one of the reasons. Other reasons, being young at the time, when we grew up, we stayed outside, we played. The thing that I'm learning today at my age and hearing what I'm hearing about uh, young people health and black men health is not something we heard when we were growing up because we stayed at it. We didn't stay on PlayStation. We didn't stay on YouTube and social media. We didn't know what cell phones were. We had, might have had a page or a star tag, but we, didn't, we was always busy outside staying busy. And that was a good thing for us. I grew up climbing a tree and, and pulling off peaches and apricots. I don't know about some of y'all. I'm, I'm used to being outside and staying active. But I also had a medical issue when I got older with my heart, which is I had hypertension even though I was stressed out as much as I was. And I heard this for maybe six, seven years prior to now, maybe longer. And they, they I, it wasn't explained to me like this panel and this group is explaining now. They would, like, they would just ask me a simple question, like, what's wrong with you? Are, are you all right? Because I kept a certain, I have a certain type of uh, uh, temperament. So I don't, look, I don't look like I'm stressed out. So they wouldn't tell me that, tell me my, my blood pressure uh, number. They would just recommend I would go see a general doctor and get some medication. Well, my numbers was like 175 over 110, 180 over 125. They was always out of range. And I happened to see this one day while I was looking at reading my, one of my forms. So to me, it was personal when uh, Amina asked me to uh, join this to get this out and spread this message to the barbershops dealing with black men and explaining things to black men about why it's important to you to uh, check on your health and to have your blood pressure checked and to get these general checkups. We, we really need it. We don't, and we act like we don't know because it's something that we don't hear all the time. It's something that we don't talk about all the time. We have, we have, have a conversation in the barbershop about any and everything except our health and how serious it is. What kind of Tim, what kind of play over? Some people might say, oh, no, that's not true. No, it's true. We will not, I, don't, I didn't talk to people about what I was going through and what I was doing with. I didn't tell other people about the thing that uh, friends of mine that were dying of heart attacks. I, the people that was in my chick would tell me about family issues and everything else. They didn't talk about their health issues. It's the same friend I cut his head. Woke up, like I said, his wife had to call 
medical, ambulance, picked him up, and five, 10 minutes later, he would have been dead if he wouldn't got to the hospital. And he worked out five days a week, two, two and a half hours a day. He literally rode a bike for an hour and walked the treadmill for at least 30 minutes during a workout. And he had three, he had three blocked arteries. So to me, that's why it's important for me to have this type of conversation. I appreciate you sharing that, especially the part about how people will talk to you about everything except. Because growing up, going into the barbershop, I heard it all except about this subject. Let me add something to that. Uh, are you aware that women live uh, five years, at least five years longer than men? You all, you all know that, right? Okay. Notice in most family structures, men's dead, the wife is still around, all right? Almost all the time, that's the way it is. Now, is that because of a difference in gender? Does that mean that, you know, female gender is just genetically stronger? Is that what it means? Uh, or does it mean that <clears throat> perhaps the gender role that we have as males interfere with our longevity, okay? And that starts with, you know, when you grow up, you know, back when you were a kid, you know, you play and you hurt yourself. I'm not gonna cry, okay? You gotta be tough, right? You always prove to the other guy how tough you are. You're not gonna say it hurt. You're not gonna get any attention for it. You're gonna keep it to yourself. You are supposed to be tough. You're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to show your emotions. These are parts of the reasons why there is a difference in the gender and the longevity. Now that goes into the effect that, and you also don't show up to the clinic to be seen for your help, all right? Uh, men generally do not come in to help care unless they are really sick, okay? But you need to be coming in before you get sick because you don't know what your numbers are. You need to know your numbers before you're sick in order to avoid terminal conditions, all right? You need to know your blood pressure. You need to know your cholesterol. You need to know your blood sugar. You need to know all of these things. You need to know those numbers and you need to know what they mean. Because if you don't get them treated, you're gonna end up living five years shorter than your spouse, or even shorter than that. So men have to really be concerned about how they respond in their gender roles. Uh, men don't talk about their emotions, all right? You'll pretend like, oh, I'm not depressed, okay? Now, the most effective clinic visits I have is if the wife comes in with the husband. Because the husband will come in and he'll say, oh, everything's great. And unless I find something wrong, everything is going to be great. But the deal is, they don't come in. So we don't find out until they have kidney damage that's permanent. We don't find out until their diabetes has caused other major complications, okay? We don't find out until they come in and they've had their stroke or their heart attack because men don't participate in their health care, especially black men. We've got to change that because it's making a huge difference in the outcomes. And we are consistently living shorter lives than white women, white men, non-Hispanics, all of the other groups are living longer than we are. And part of it is because we're not getting the care that we have the privilege of obtaining. So you really do, even if, as a young person as you are, you need to know what your numbers are. You need to know where you are with your health. You can't ignore it, okay? You don't wanna wait until something bad happens and then you show up and wanna get it fixed, okay? All right, so speaking of something bad happening, it's been reported that sometimes the reason we don't want to take medicine is because it interferes with some other medicine that we like. 
talking about erectile dysfunction. So there's some new studies out, I know you wanted to share about that. Yeah, there's studies out that are attributable to uh, the correlation and connection between hypertension and erectile dysfunction. And I just really want to piggyback and reemphasize what the doctor was talking about as for us young uh, black men. I was young once. I'm a little bit older than a lot of you. So, you know, I was in denial. I'm, I have hypertension. And that's what caused me to get involved with this program is because I wanted to make sure that individuals like myself, when I looked at a reflection of myself, I look out in this audience and I see reflections of myself. I wanted to be proactive so that young black men wouldn't be like me. They wouldn't go into this denial stage. We have a doctor here, which to me is like the greatest gift. Because if I go into the doctor's office and I can see a reflection of myself, I'm like, man, I'm with that. You know what I'm saying? Here's, here's somebody I can relate to. He's relatable. That's one of the core reasons why I got into this program of education and awareness and prevention and intervention for hypertension. Um, I wanna play a little game with you right quick and then we're gonna get right back to uh, talking about hypertension in ED. I want each and everybody to just look to their neighbor and just ask them, are you good? Doctor, are you good? Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? Guys, you, did, you, did, you, did you play along with me? You're good, everybody's good, right? Okay, you think you're good. The reason why I say that is, is because you cannot look at someone and tell that they have hypertension. If I had not have told you that I have hypertension, you would not know that I have hypertension. Now it's managed with diet, exercise, and medication. But for the longest time, I was just in denial. And it was beginning to affect, affect other aspects of my lifestyle, including my performance. And fellas, we all know what the performance is. That performance is that erectile dysfunction performance. I was like, well, what's wrong with my performance? She looking at me like, oh. oh. <laughs> Don't be like me, gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? You're young right now and you're laughing. Cause you're like, oh, I'm a young bug. You know what I'm saying? It can't ever happen to me. Okay. I thought the exact same thing. I wasn't, now is the time for you to develop those good habits, those healthy lifestyle habits like my man was talking about here. Once you get that and incorporate it into, that, into your routine, it becomes part of your lifestyle. Then you won't have to go through the denials that I was going through. You know, what's wrong with, what's wrong? Jimmy, what's happening? You know? Because hypertension will lead to erectile dysfunction. And I just want to be as blunt as possible because I want to make sure that us in this barbershop, like we was talking about, we talk about everything else. We can talk about Jordan a thousand million times. We talk about the goats and all that, but we don't talk about what's important. We don't talk about why Willie ain't performing right. Willie ain't performing right because your hypertension ain't right. Your blood pressure is elevated. And you got a blood pressure team right over there and you'll walk right by them and tell them a bold face lie and say, I'm good, knowing daggone well you ain't good at all. Why? Because you don't even know your numbers. Know your numbers. Know that you're good. Know that if your blood pressure is elevated, it's going to lead to other things. It's going to lead to, like the doctor said, a kidney failure. My man here, his friend had a uh, major trauma with his heart, you know what I'm saying, surgery. You know, I suffer from erectile dysfunction. But I was like, oh no, 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 that ain't happening. So I started getting some action, you know what I'm saying, started taking action so that I can make sure that, you know what I'm saying, when it comes time to show time, performance time, the fellas, I'm just being blunt. Because these are the conversations that we need to be having. Because these are those taboo conversations that you really don't want to talk to your pops about, you don't want to talk to your buddy about, because you're embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I'm tired, I'm, I'm past being embarrassed now. I'm to the point now where it's time for us to take some action. It's time for us to make it aware, 
and, and put these preventative measures in place so that you aren't like me, all right? So in addition to your blood pressure, check your glucose and cholesterol and doctor tell you everything. Get it, get it checked out. So we're wrapping up this first segment, but before we do, I'm gonna talk about stress. Say we're gonna come to it. You mentioned you didn't know how stressed you were. A lot of us carry stress and don't know. We just think it's normal. We walk through the streets every day and face systemic racism, and we think it's normal. We have a toxic family structure, and we think it's normal. We don't know that we're stressed. So I wanna start with you, since you brought it up. And just, just tell me maybe, maybe why it's important to get it out, maybe mental health, why it's important to take time every day just to be quiet and sit or whatever you need to do to help. But let's talk about that. Uh, one of the things I did to actually have myself stressful, I literally got rid of cable TV. Uh, I try not to be on the, my phone looking at whatever I can look at. Um, I force myself, if I wake up, I don't care how exhausted I am, I will actually roll out the bed onto the floor, put on some shoes and go for at least a one to two mile walk, at least five days out the week. Try my best to uh, go to the gym at least three. Stay, because um, I have hypertension. I stay up on my medication at all times. Um, I tend to be and do things by myself. Not all the time. I like being. I like having family events. I like having friends around. But I like to be by myself. And some people will understand. It's in the spiritual world, I go to my. We call. We what we will call. Some of y'all probably don't know. Some of y'all do know. It's prayer clock. Let me go meditate. Let me go. Let me go have a conversation with the God I believe. So. I get myself prepared mentally in that aspect. Like today, I had a, I had a busy day. Uh, electrical issue, unit messed up at the barber shop. Uh, friend having some personal issues. I had to get some stuff dealing with my brother with my taxes. Then I turn around and get another phone call about some other things and get some information started today. I didn't think I was going to make it today. S yesterday, I didn't have anything planned but to go and have a conversation with my brother. So th these dif di different types of things can happen so quickly that you don't even understand that you are just stressed out, or you have, or you're carrying this type of stress in your life. You know, and coming up here, it's relaxing to sit here and have a conversation to see young people, especially get this type of information and uh, put themselves in a, and have the ability to put themselves in a better position. If I go back when I used to coach, I just loved coaching, enjoyed it. But I hated to deal with all the other things that came with coaching. Deal with the parents. You gotta deal with the child that don't wanna listen, that don't wanna do what needs to be done. You can't say anything because you know, we're in a different era. You can't talk in a certain way to young people like you could when we was growing up. So when you look at and then when you talk about systemic racism, see this black man, I see that on TV every day. That's all the time. To me, and to me, being black, it's normal. To some, they don't even know what we're talking about. Some people don't have an idea that they can't go into a community because they skin tone. But if you ask any black man, any person of color, at one point, depending on where they go, anywhere, they gonna think they gonna have some type of, should I be here or should not be here? Could you think you're gonna get pulled over and ask some questions that you don't need to be answering. I'm just coming over here to go stop by the store or visit a friend. I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not part of whatever you think I'm a part of. All I want to do is just drive over here, leave, go home. Don't pull me up. And I've had many conversations with law enforcement officers. And the crazy part is I'm in law enforcement officers. So I see it all the time. Good information. And for those of you that are, are barbers, barbers in training, take this. You gotta make small talk, right? You gotta talk to your people while they're in the chair. This is things you can help with. So philanthropists, you never deal with systemic racism, right? Never happens. Not really. <laughs> and you don't get stressed out. You don't ever make bad food choices. Let's talk about how nutrition plays a factor with your health. Well, for me, I started the whole fitness uh, lifestyle as an early, as an early teenager, you know, I did natural bodybuilding as an athlete. Um, I remember the first time I cooked egg whites 
in my mom's kitchen. And she goes, you know, when you cook egg whites, they have a certain smell. And she's like, why are you cooking that stinky stuff in my house? So I had to stop cooking egg whites. I said, mom, it's my protein. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but nutrition is huge. You know, every 30 days, your body recycles what you eat. So if you're eating fast foods or making bad food choices, you know, the end result is what you see in the mirror, that's what you get. So if you're eating healthy, then your overall appearance will appear healthy. Your skin will appear, will appear healthy. But if you have a lifestyle of unhealthy choices, and that's what causes the health issues. Um, prime example, when I was talking to my sister before she passed away, I said, you gotta start eating healthier and, and making better choices with uh, certain things, and she didn't listen. So when I got that phone call saying she had a heart attack, one day before her birthday, it just shook my heart. So I started my foundation based on personal tra tragedies. Um, I lost my mom to cancer. I lost my youngest brother to gun violence. He was 16. Um, I lost an uncle and just so many family members. So that's what really triggered me to want to give back as a former athlete, that was my way to give back and educate our youth because my main um, objective with the foundation is to combat youth obesity and diabetes through a sports platform. And so what we do is we have nutritional education workshops for the parents and the, the youth and teens. So therefore, you know, when you teach the kids at an early age, as they get older, they have better knowledge on how to eat better because when you when they have better nutrition, their brain function is better. When they're active, they just perform just better in out of school. Um, so that's one of the things that we promote through the foundation, um, and we primarily work with at-risk and underprivileged kids to give them an opportunity to see things, you know, that privileged children don't have the opportunity, you know what I mean? So we try to educate them the best way we can and part of the next generation. But so um, as a fitness expert, first things first is when I sit down with the client, I do a nutritional education analysis. And it, you know, it's, it, it, when, you, when you write down, like say for instance, if you write down the entire week of what you eat on paper, from breakfast to lunch to dinner, in between snacks and so forth. And if it doesn't look right on paper, nine times out of 10, you're not eating healthy. So once you see it on paper and it's healthy, then you know you're making the right choices. So, you know, I recommend everyone to make a, create a uh, food diary and just write everything down for a week just so you can see exactly what your caloric intake is. Where those where are those calories coming from? Um, where does good food, food choices or bad food choices, just try that for a week and you'll see exactly what's going on. But um, whether you're trying to gain muscle or lose body fat, nutrition is the key. You know, and I, I can get real scientific with it, but I'll keep it very basic. You know, like prime example, every meal should have one protein source, uh, one or two vegetables. You got diff two different types of carbs. You got fibrous and starchy carbs. And then your starchy carb, that's your energy source. Your fibrous carb is basically a protein. But then you gotta have your good fats. You know, you can't just get your fats from bad foods. There's fish oil, there's flaxseed oil, there's extra virgin olive oil. So there's better choices when it comes to, um, you know, different aspects of your diet. And so once you, once you see how your body responds to certain uh, food choices, then you'll feel so much better energy-wise. Like prime example, the majority of my female clients, when I sit down with them and I analyze what they're eating, a lot of them never ate breakfast. And that's the most important meal, important meal of the day. So I always recommend if you don't eat breakfast, at least have a protein shake, which is like a meal replacement. You know, maybe add a little, like a half a teaspoon of oatmeal, maybe peanut butter for some fat. Um, and then you have your meal three hours after that because most protein shakes last about an hour and a half. So it's really important. Um, 
your carbohydrates, that's your energy source. Prime example, when I have clients, I say, what'd you have for lunch? I had a salad. I said, well, where's your protein? There was no protein, so it's just salad. So that's basically a, fi a fibrous carbohydrate. That's not your energy source. And then when I see clients come in with their stone face and glass eye, it's because they don't educate themselves on the proper carbohydrates to stabilize their blood sugars. So if you ever notice like during the daytime and you feel lethargic and you feel like your blood sugars have dropped, you felt like that before? It's because of the lack of uh, the proper carbohydrates. Who knows what a, a good carbohydrate is? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Wheat? Like oatmeal? Yeah, oatmeal is one of the best carbohydrates you can have. And that's why I say breakfast, that's the most important meal. Like say if you guys, if you guys are barbers, you should always make sure you get breakfast, especially oatmeal, because that'll last you three hours. But make sure you add some protein with that. Because you're constantly working, you're constantly on your feet. Make sure you keep your body hydrated. And then, you know, you'll be ready to eat your next meal around lunchtime. So you try to eat something every two and a half, three hours to keep your metabolism fast and also your, carb, your brain needs carbs to function. And if you don't have the proper carbohydrates, and if you're thinking about cutting somebody's hair, you might be like low on blood sugar, and the next thing you know, you gave, a, you gave them a different haircut that they wanted because you were low on carbs, right? <laughs> we can't, you can't afford that, or you lose a lot of customers. <laughs> um, so I try to make light of it, but um, it's very serious. Um, it is a lifestyle, nutrition is so important. Um, like I said, if you're trying to build muscle, protein is the key. You have to increase your overall caloric intake to build mass. You have to train a certain way. If you're trying to lose body fat, even, even if you're trying to lose body fat, you have to burn 4,500 calories a day to burn one pound of fat. Average person needs to, you know, tries to lose about two pounds a week. So there's a system that I use when it comes to cardio. So your cardio calories have to be higher than your food intake calories. So if you're burning 7,200 calories a week in cardio calories, that's gonna give you your two pounds of body fat loss as long as your, your caloric intake supports the body fat loss. That means that you have to make healthy choices. Understand? So, you know, it's important to eat. Average person eats three times a day, so break that three meals into four meals daily make sure each meal is balanced and then you'll feel great because prime example if you're going to exercise like say friends if you're if you are nine to fiver and you work you get off at five o'clock so that means that your your carbohydrate meal should be around 3 30 so by the time you get to your workouts your body can break that down as fuel so you can get through your workouts um, because a lot of clients who show up and they don't eat the proper carbs, they struggle through the workouts. So it's really about your carbohydrate choices. So one of the best carbohydrates, which is naturally sweet, that, and it also stabilizes your blood sugars, is sweet potatoes. Who likes sweet potatoes? Now I didn't say sweet potatoes with sugar all over it. I didn't say sweet potatoes, candied yams. That's like diabetes in a spoon. And, and as African Americans, listen, I grew up eating that stuff because I didn't know any better. But as I got more educated on eating healthy, my parents around the holidays looked at me like I was crazy. I said, no, I'm good. I'll pass on the dressing because it's all bread, it's all starches. And as you know, uh, bread is your waistline's worst enemy because they stick to your ribs. You know, the average person around the holidays, they gain about five to eight pounds because you're sitting around eating good, desserts. But who goes for a walk after that? Not many, right? And it, especially the turkey, which is, it has a chemical called L-tryptophan, which makes you naturally sleepy. So um, each meal should be moderate. I've seen people in my family stack the plates up. I'm like, who are you eating for, an army? So everything in moderation. Um, and if you're, 
if you want to make healthier choices, give yourself one cheat meal per seven days, not the entire day. Like I was doing a client's nutrition plan and I gave her uh, healthy choices for snacks. So what she did was she ate all the snacks. She wasn't supposed to do that. And she goes, I'm so full. I said, first of all, you get one snack, not all of them. So, <laughs> so yeah, just try to give yourself one healthy meal per seven days and keep everything in strict and you're good. So every three hours, you know, each meal, make sure each meal is balanced and then you'll be in good shape. So write everything down and you'll see everything. And it'll keep things in perspective. If it's not healthy, make better food choices. And when you see it on paper, it keeps your head in the game. If you don't write it down, you're all over the place. And then you end up forcing yourself to make bad choices. So to be continued, thank you. Well, I can't just snack and snack and and snack. No. Okay. All right. I'm gonna change. You snacks in between your meals. I'm gonna I'm change. Okay. All right. So we're gonna take a quick break, and before we do, I just want to say it is not a smoke break. Well, I didn't get no amens in this church. <laughs> As it relates to nutrition, uh, one of the reasons why you need to be more aware of nutrition is because we have an epidemic of diabetes, okay? We're an epidemic status, especially in the African-American community. We have diabetes all over the place, and that's another one you'll walk around for five years. If you don't see your doctor, you'll walk around for five years before you even diagnosed with diabetes because you won't have any symptoms, okay? Uh, diabetes is epidemic. Our kids are pre-diabetic. They're getting to be pre-diabetic at eight years old. They're gonna be diabetic by the time they reach high school, okay? Which is gonna shorten their lives. So nutrition is really important from a diabetic point of view as well. So we really gotta pay more attention to what we're taking in. I always tell my patients uh, when it comes to nutrition and you know people don't eat breakfast, um, I say you eat breakfast like a king, you eat lunch like a prince, and you eat dinner like a pauper, okay? Stack your meals early in the day. Many people end up eating their biggest meal eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, especially here in Las Vegas since we're open 24 hours. They eat nine o'clock at night, okay? Go to bed, and every bit of that which they put in, they wear it the next day. Absolutely. So you got to concentrate on getting your calories in the early part of the day, okay? And then get some exercise on top of that. Right. Appreciate that so much. So before we take a quick break, because sitting is the new smoking. So we're going to just stand up, take like 60 seconds, Gonna have some new panelists when we get back, Doctor. You, you, you two are staying, so don't don't get too happy. <laughs> but I just want to encourage you if you are using any tobacco product, whether it is traditional cigarettes, vape, hookah, anything like that, there are resources that can help you quit. No judgment, nothing like that. But we do just want you to take care of your health because tobacco actually contributes to heart disease. More people die from heart disease related to tobacco than from lung disease. A lot of people are like, whoa, didn't know that. So just keep it in the Heart Health family, but one let you know that. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and we'll be right back here in 120 seconds. <laughs> All right, well, welcome back. We are continuing our discussion on heart health, particularly how it affects black men in our community and why it's so important to have these conversations. So for this part of our barbershop talk, we're gonna discuss taking care of your heart like your heart takes care of you. Because how many of you know if your heart stops beating, that's it, right? Yeah, so we have two new panelists, welcome. We've got Richard and Diane. So glad to have you on here. So just well, by way of introduction, just tell us what you do and why you're here today. 
my name is Diane Swapshire. I'm an RN complex case manager for Nevada Health Centers. And uh, I really, well, I do COVID vaccines, but I also do complex case managing with some of our sicker patients. So by the time a lot of our patients see me, they are already diagnosed diabetic or um, hypertensive and uh, or they've had an event that took them to the emergency room or uh, they were hospitalized. So when they see me, I'm gonna get them into an appointment, uh, which is what I wanna talk about here today, access to healthcare. And um, we do video appointments at Nevada Health Center and uh, inpatient appointments, same day appointments we can get you in. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> And thank you for being here. So you got a story to share, right? So introduce yourself and we want to hear about it. Hello everyone. My name is Richard Harvey and Darnell Harvey is my brother. So there may be some resemblance, but I'm not him. Uh, I'm a native of uh, uh, Nevada, born and raised in Las Vegas. We've been here all our lives. Uh, like Darnell said, pretty much raised up in this area. So this is my uh, familiar stomping grounds as well. But the story that I'd like to uh, share is um, something that ha happened to me that led me to where I'm at now. In 2008, I, uh, I worked in the convention and trade show industry for 20 plus years, but there was a, a, a change that happened and most of us can rem remember that kind of happened most recently with this COVID pa pandemic. That means um, the housing market crashed and forced out of um, the private sector in, into self-employment. And with that, when you leave self-employment, uh, excuse me, the private sector, when you have health care coverage, your employers pretty much have you in a group plan, <clears throat> plan and you're part of that group savings and you, you're able to get that. Uh, 2008, 2009, fast forward, became self-employed and didn't have that coverage anymore. So you have to scramble, but one of the, the things that happened that year was the Obama administration with the Affordable Care Act. And access to health care was primary and it was actually expanded to the Medicaid program where states was actually expanding it. So if you were self-employed, you were getting in on health care. And so that's access to health care from the self-employment uh, perspective. And a lot of barbers, or most of you are gonna be self-employed. That led me to get into insurance and I've been writing in uh, insurance as a second act in career uh, since 20, 2010. I uh, partnered up with Nevada Health Link. I'm a case manager there now. And a lot of things, a lot of new things are happening in the uh, health industry at Nevada Health Link. Uh, with the new Biden plan, the American Rescue Plan, healthcare has actually been expanded to August 15. So that's a lot of things happening, and I'd like to share that with you today as we. Uh, move around this panel and just explain more what's happening and how we should be taking advantage of that right now. All right, thank you for sharing that. I can definitely relate to those high self-employment costs. People think being a business owner is just you know easy and, and wonderful because you call the shots, but that's a whole nother panel. We'll talk about another time. So I want to talk about why it is that it seems as though men don't access healthcare even when they have it. So I'm gonna ask you the question this way. Why is it that women go to their doctor more often than men? Well, I think uh, women go and take care of their um, women's needs as far as mammograms and pap smears. Uh, men generally, since we're speaking frankly, they do not go unless they have an episode. And that's erectile dysfunction, that's, um, an event that took them to the emergency room or uh, hospitalization, stroke, uh, headache, pain is what bring men in. Women generally come because they're getting their yearly checks. A lot of women, a lot of my friends, they come uh, for their birthdays, around their birthdays. They decide, okay, I'm going to go in for this one visit. So women tend to... Um, because they're the nurturers, their kids could be prodding them to go. Um, but yeah, I, I think that is why men generally won't show up unless they have an episode. 
And I see that a lot as, as far as um, nothing that you can see as far as stroke and heart attack or um, an episode with diabetes are the major things. But they will come if they're having an episode of erectile dysfunction, that will bring them in or pain. And so we're, we're trying to prevent that with a lot of the younger men, especially come in and get your check. Make it around your birthdays. Um, if it's not your birthday coming up soon, just say you're gonna do it this year as soon as possible. Um, we have walk-in appointments again. We have um, sliding fee scales. There's never a demand at Nevada Health Centers for monies up front. You can be seen whether you're insured or you're paying out of pocket or no cash that day. Uh, we never turn anyone away. Come in and get your numbers checked. As all of the panelists have talked about today, it's very important to know your numbers. We love to eat things that taste good and you can look great. You can have abs and your weight can be down, but your stress level could be up and you not even know it. So sorry to get off track there, but I just think a lot of men uh, as the doctor said, you carry stressors and you do not even know. Um, and the other panelists have said, so please come in and get your numbers checked. If you're not asked for money up front, being a barber, you may not have insurance. There's a $35 fee that you would pay to see a doctor. Get your numbers checked, start while you're young. Uh, even if you're not young, start today. Thank you. And so for all of you didn't know, but now you're officially public health because this is something that you'll encounter on a regular basis and you can share this information just while you cut, just while you talk. So doctor, how often should we be visiting our doctor? Well, that's, the, the, okay. People will generally say, <clears throat> I'm gonna go in for my physical, all right? And that'll turn out to be around once a year when you're younger. Uh, you should go in at least once a year. Okay, generally we like to start seeing people as adults by the time they're 18. Okay, you're 18, you're an adult. You need to start coming in once a year. Uh, but that doesn't happen especially with men. And again, it's the old gender roles that we fall into. Uh, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to share. We don't want to say things that you're concerned about. Uh, we're too independent. We're too strong, okay? We can't admit that we have some concerns about our health, so we don't do anything with it, okay? But you need to start coming in 18 and above every year. You go in for what is your physical, okay? And at that time, you know, you're gonna get your blood pressure checked. If you have other issues that you're willing to share or we can draw it out of you, then we can address it. Um, you should have some lab testing to know a baseline. You need to know your blood sugar, you need to know your blood pressure, your cholesterol. You need to know these basic things as a starting point. And then every year, you can recheck that and see if there's any significant change. And over time, you respond to those changes. And along the way, we also try to educate you into what are the other things that you will need to do as you reach certain age ranges. Like, just recently, <clears throat> there is a change in recommendation for uh, colonoscopies. Uh, previously we were saying when you're 50 years old you need to start getting a colonoscopy. Well now that age has dropped down to 45. So if you're 45 years old now you need to start getting a colonoscopy every 10 years as long as it's normal. Okay? There are other things that we do based on your age grouping and your behaviors. If you're a smoker, there are certain things we have to do, and we certainly don't want you smoking, okay? That's just really bad and unnecessary. Um, but every year, you need to go visit your doctor. You need to have an honest, open discussion about what your concerns are, especially if you are having concerns about your emotional state, and it's okay to say, 
you know, I think I'm having a problem with depression, okay? Men don't talk about that, all right? Men don't talk about their emotions. We will see a person for their depression if their spouse comes in with them. Otherwise, we don't find it out until they do something that's inappropriate because they're depressed. So you got to be willing to share those things that you're concerned about and accept educational feedback, okay? I might steal that clip. It's bad and unnecessary. Yes, it is. I, I just love it. All right, and I also love the fact that we're in the barbershop. People are getting cut right now, and we're having this conversation. So hopefully this can continue even when the panelists are gone. So I want to turn to you. Men have a natural tendency to want to protect, and part of that means we also don't trust that easily. That means we don't necessarily trust the health system that much. Can you talk a little bit about how we can trust it? and maybe some of the reasons why we don't right now. Well, I could be here all night talking about some of the reasons why African-American men um, don't trust the health system. I'm, I'm just gonna mention Tuskegee for one of the main, because that's probably the most uh, notable reason why. But um, I think it's, it's, it's essential and critical that um, African-American men and blacks in general, just be involved. You know what I'm saying? It's our help. Um, as I sit up here with this panel, I see a reflection of myself. And that's one of the main reasons why I decided to become a nurse is because when um, a young African-American male came, comes in, I want them to see a reflection of themselves. I want to be able to make that connection, you know, so that they will feel comfortable coming in to a facility and they see someone who may have, ex they, who shares their experiences. So I think that's critically important to, to be able to reach out and say to a young African-American teenager or preteen or 20 year or 30 year and say, you know, I know what you're talking about because that's what was important to me. I had to go in there and someone actually experience some of the experiences, those shared experiences that I've had. I think that the doctor put it, Dr. Mitchell just, he hit the nail dead on the head. We are as African uh, American men, we're just brought up different. We're brought up to be, um, like he said earlier, get up boy, don't cry, you know, you fell down. You know, that's, you know, soft. We're brought up to be hard, you know, shake it off. And you know, like uh, the RN here said, forgive me for not remembering your name. I'm terrible with names. You know, women. You know, they they're going to the doctor all the time. They have women needs, and you know, they're going to show up. Men, we don't until the leg is broke off. You know, Sam, we ain't going to the doctor. Uh, perfect example. I was uh, at a at a barbershop, uh, and I know that the uh, barbershop. Uh, program, they have different outlets throughout the city. And a guy came in and um, I'm looking at him and you know, we had the Know Your Numbers campaign. And I was like, are you good? You know, get your you know, numbers checked. And uh, he was like, no, nah, man, I'm good. You know, I said, well, how you know you good? Well, I went to the doctor like last year, two years ago. And I was like, wow, t two years ago. And what was interesting is, is you know, in the barbershop, we talk about a whole lot of different things. And he had just bought a new car, right? New Jaguar, it's nice. And so, you know, he's just bragging about this car. He's going on and on and on. And uh, he, I asked him, I said, uh, how long you had the car? Oh man, I've had it, uh, I want to say about four months. And so I asked him, I said, uh, have you had the oil changed on it yet? Oh yeah, man, I, it's got all the paperwork inside the glove box. I got all, everything's up to date. I don't miss no, I said, so you care more about that car than you do about your physical health. You make sure that you've taken that car to get all of its checkups. You know, you've got it tuned up, you keep it fine tuned. You haven't even had it six months and you've already changed the oil once. And we have to get into that mindset that our bodies, are the temple. We need to get into that frame of mind of self-care, self-awareness. 
And I think that the stigma of science kind of contributes to that. And that's why for me, I'm, I'm gonna say for me, and it could be for some of the other ones as well, to see professionals, Dr. Mitchell, my nurse friend over here, other professionals who are reflective of what I am in the industry provides me a sense of comfort. It provides me an opportunity to say, you know what, I can relate to that. You know what I'm saying? Here's a guy who, you know, he, he might not be from exactly from my background, but we kind of look the same. And so I'm gonna hear what he has to say. And if he says, you know what, Jamerson, you need to come in here more often. You know, you're in your 50s now. I, I need to see you in my office. You know what I'm saying? At least three times a year because you, you have hypertensive uh, uh, challenges. Then I'm gonna take him and take the advice that he gives me and, and hold him a little bit more closer. And I think that the youngsters need to kinda, we need to educate them on the significance of having that trust because it's hard to develop that trust because of um, our country's story past, so to speak. But we can change that by our active engagement and our active involvement. And that's why it's critical to have panels like this so that the youngsters can see that there are individuals out in this community that are proactively engaged in educating, making them aware, preventing and interventions. And that to me is what's important. And I think that that's what's going to um, uh, solidify and catapult the young generation to be more involved in science and educating and uh, you know just you know, getting us to the point where, you know, wellness is more important than a jag. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. And I, I like the jag part, though. How I, how I get the jag? I know you're a nurse, so you're making that, you know, that good nurse money. Just messing with you. All right, so there has been some inequity in our healthcare system, right? We just know. It, you mentioned the price, how much it costs. What are some ways that people can get linked up with someone like you and have access to affordable health care? So again, I work for Nevada Health Centers and we have like eight locations in Las Vegas uh, to Henderson and um, a total of 18 throughout the state of Nevada. We're a federally funded um, quality health center and uh, again, you can walk in, you're, you will not be turned away. Um, we have a $35 fee um, for patients and you can pay that at another time. Uh, we turn no one away. We also take commercial insurance. Um, we take Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, with the commercial insurance, I would advise you to check and make sure um, that your insurance will pay for your visit with us. But we urge you to find a healthcare provider um, even if you don't come to Nevada Health Centers, there are other providers out there um, that are willing to see you uh, on a slide base, and it's according to your income. Uh, but again, if you came to Nevada Health Centers, you don't have to prove that. Um, just turn the papers with, with, in within 30 days. So you can have a visit tomorrow, as early as tomorrow, walk in and uh, see a doctor and know your numbers. Perfect. That, that doesn't sound too hard. So, good. I like that. Sure. And, and with that said, Nevada, what's what's the name of you? Nevada Health Center. Nevada Health Center. There's centers like that and free clinics. But when, we, when you think of being self-employed and you think about health care, you think about high costs. And outside of these services, um, just speaking from the expansion and the, uh, the American Rescue Plan, Nevada Health Link is actually taking enrollment now. So if you go to NevadaHealthLink.com until August 15th, you can see if you qualify for the advanced premium tax credit, which could offset some of your premium costs, or you may be paying zero to a very low cost for a monthly premium to have more access to healthcare coverage. And also with the Affordable Healthcare Act, uh, every American is entitled to a preventive medical visit one per year, no matter what. You can go and get your labs taken, 
You can get preventive care, a checkup, and you don't even have to have health care coverage. So it's just information is important. When I became self-employed, one of my biggest fears is if I get sick, everything can just be wiped out if we didn't have services like yours and clinics as well. But right now, with the expansion of Medicaid and the Affordable Health Care Act, things are happening and moving in this state right now where you uh, just, just take some time and just do a little due diligence and go online to valuehealthlink.com and you can take it and see if you, you qualify for the advanced premium tax credit. You, you, act, you have access to health care and dental care. So that's what this, these panels, I, I, I appreciate the fact that I, I wasn't scheduled to speak today. I came in with uh, my brother, but these opportunities, if I can speak and share some information, I love it. Appreciate what you added, that's so critical. And, and knowing is half the battle, right? So awesome. I'm gonna say thank you to Masterpiece Barber School for hosting this incredible panel. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you to our incredible panelists and our incredible audience. Give yourselves a hand up. I want to say thank you also to the Southern Nevada Health District for doing this program and for all of that they do uh, for our community. This is important work and you all are absolutely a part of it. So visit GetHealthyClarkCounty.org. There is so much information, things you never even thought to think about. It's on the website. So visit GetHealthyClarkCounty.org for more information about any of the subjects tonight and health in general. If you haven't already, get your blood pressure checked or go get your COVID shot. That's, I believe they're still here, right? So, yes, so if that hasn't happened yet, make sure you get that taken care of. The way I wanna close is just give us one or two sentences about why health is wealth. And we'll start with the ladies first. The reason why health is wealth is because as long as you have breath and you're healthy, you can do accomplish all the things you want in life. When you're sick, that's a stressor there. So I'd say know your numbers, get your blood pressure checked, get a primary care provider. Uh, you can come see us and uh, no money up front. Thank you. Your health is your wealth and you have to pay attention. There are a couple of things I wanna add. <clears throat> if you are on medicine, know the name of your medicine. Don't go to your doctor and say the pink pill, the blue pill, the white pill. Educate yourself and know what medicines you're taking. Another important point you need to know, what is your family history? What, what, what did that uncle die from? You need to know what your family history is because it is likely that some of that is gonna come to you. So ask questions of your older family members. What kind of health problems have we had as a group of people? You need to know that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. I just wanna say health is wealth to me because it's, it's all about awareness. It's all about um, education and inclusion. I, I walked around for almost decades just almost clueless or in denial until one day I just, you know, opened my eyes and said, you know what, I gotta make some changes. I gotta make some lifestyle changes. And once I started with myself, then I wanted everyone around me to enjoy the splendors of a healthy wellness lifestyle. So I started with myself, with my household, with my block, with my neighborhood, with my community, my city, state, global, and beyond. I think that's, to me, is what health and wellness is all about. Well said. Um, health is wealth, and I piggyback on awareness. Awareness is being young when you think you're eight foot tall and bullet, bulletproof, nothing can hit you. But from the outside looking in, you think all is going good. But you look inside and you do your blood work and things are just not happening right. Because that's where the information is inside. So outside you may be looking well, but inside knowing now that to have your, your blood pressure checked, have, have your labs taken so you know what your cholesterol is, 
in, uh, in what your sugar count is. For me, you don't know how good you feel until you get sick. So awareness and just action is, is healthy to, as well to me. And uh, you, if you start now, healthy habits uh, live with you forever. I'm in my mid fifties now, but no, if I had panels like this when I was younger, starting like like the nutritionist was talking about the uh, the food intake and how we should be eating, and your protein and your calories, and a doctor talking about loading up in the morning and then and tapering down in the evening. You're starting young, those healthy habits continue. So healthy habits is health as well. All right, thank you all. And so, so that you can know that you are good, know your numbers. And if you take nothing else from this panel today, take that away. Make sure you start seeing your primary care and know your numbers. And I would like to remind you, you are not just a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. What you do matters. So being here, just wanna say thank you.